Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am with the talented Mikey Elephant. Mikey, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you Zed? I'm doing well, thank you. Great. So if you're not familiar with Mikey, Mikey is a very talented Greenwood worker hailing from Israel. Currently he's visiting the UK and we're filming at Spoontown, which is the largest spoon carving gathering in the south of England. So I need to give a huge thanks to Jules Swan, the founder of Spoontown for allowing us to film uh, at this event. And we're also filming under the shelter owned by Phil Kyra. So I need to give a huge thanks to Phil Kyra for letting us film. And he's also made this beautiful chair. He's I'm made this on. stunning chair, which we'll actually have a look at. That's a good reminder, actually. Yeah. That's a good reminder. We'll have a look at his chair because he's a very talented maker himself. So if you're not familiar with Mikey, like I said, he's a very talented Greenwood worker from Israel, currently traveling here in the United Kingdom. Now, what we're going to do in this video, we're going to be looking at Mikey's process for carving an asymmetrical spoon. If you're not familiar with what that kind of shape is or what the design entails, don't worry, we will be looking at an example shortly. Now, in this video, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at the entire process. So Mike is very kindly going to be taking us from literally a fresh piece of wood all the way to a finished spoon, leaving no stone unturned. Now, a couple of things to facilitate the process of this video. As you can see, it is a long video. That's because it is a long process. So there's a, a couple of things to aid with that. Number one, if you see along the timeline of this video, you will see all the different sections marked out. That allows it for easier navigation when you're watching, so you know what particular section that we, we're talking about. Also, in the description below, you can see all those different sections of the video marked out. On the left-hand side, you will see all the numbers uh, uh, indicating the timeline. YouTube has a very cool feature. If you click on that time, the video will jump straight to that particular section. So as you move forward, you can use this as a reference video. So rather than having to manually scroll through the entire video, you can see, okay, I want to look at this particular section here. Click on that time and YouTube will take you straight to that section. Now, what we're going to do first and foremost, we're going to have a look at some examples of Mikey's work, as well as talking about Mikey as a maker. So you can get familiar about him, what he does and his background. And then, like I said, we're going to look at some examples and then we're going to get straight into the meat and bones of this video. So Mikey, with your kind permission, Shall we begin? Yes, let's right. go ahead. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video where Mikey Elephant is going to be showing you how to carve an asymmetrical spoon. So Mikey, before we get into looking at your selection of spoons that you brought with you, yeah. um, in case people are not familiar with you as a maker, would you like to talk a little bit about your background and what it is you do? Well, so I've been um, carving wood since I was about 16. And um, I guess somewhere in my early 20s, I kind of said maybe I should you know, take this a little bit more seriously. And really it's become the only thing I've done consistently in my life. Um, and, and at times I'm, I actually do it well. That being said, I do owe a lot of what I, what I know to people like Yoav El Kayam and, and other people from the community um, here in the UK. And what's happened is, is I'm very, very lucky to live on a small place called Kibbutz Tzivon. And about six years ago, I had this crazy idea of building a woodland craft center for teaching. So we have people coming in and learning different skills, not only green woodworking, but also weaving, um, felting, all kinds of different crafts and blacksmithing as well. I'm very, very lucky to have, you know, these amazing partners who were like, yeah, let's do this together and let's build a woodland craft center. Although <clears throat> we're in Israel and there really was nothing like it uh, beforehand. There actually isn't anything like it today. And so, I do a lot of spoon carving, but I'm, I'm, I try to be more multidisciplinary these days. And I, I have done some blacksmithing. Um, some of my tools are, are made by myself because, you know, if you need a tool, the best thing you can do is, is go and make it instead of buying it. And that, I think, is also part of what I believe in <coughs> uh, when it comes to being a maker, and that is kind of making um, your own tools and just being self-sufficient in that way. And that's, I think that's part of the agenda that I try to bring into spoon carving. It's more 
there's more to it than just the spoon. So we like to say back in Sivon, it's not about the spoon. There's, there's a really more of a holistic approach to looking at wood, to understanding wood, and just uh, being out in the wild and, and enjoying your day and carving. I think that as a holistic approach, you know, the spoon becomes very, very um, a small aspect to it. Some of the spoons I carve, <coughs> I try to get them in a very, I guess, um, I want them to stand out. I want them to, people, you know, want, I want people to be able to look at them and say, oh, let's pick that one up. So often I'll use some funky woods. And we, we don't have a really great wood selection in Israel. So it's, it, it is not always that easy. But we do have some really special woods like Syrian pear. Um, and so when I say asymmetrical, usually what I'll mean is that the bottom end of that bowl is going to have some kind of curve to it. And at the end of the spoon, there's going to be a corresponding curve. And they kind of try and talk together. About a year ago, I started putting in this little notch. And I'm really enjoying it, actually. It, when, when the spoon is in my hand, I enjoy having a look at that and how um, asymmetrical it is to the other side. So instead of trying to constantly match um, your spoon, I, I, really, um, I really like to encourage people to kind of do something a little bit more creative. Um, a lot of my spoons are, are on the thinner side, uh, and, and I guess you're not supposed to be scooping ice cream with them. But the reason for that is sometimes I really enjoy using leftover pieces that people have kind of chucked away where they're, you know, they've surgically chosen the piece of wood that they want, but they end up, you know, with a lot of excess wood. So this is, I think, a really nice spoon that's just made from, you know, a piece that someone has chucked away. Um, we have, I've got, you know, like, like um, wild plum here. There's cherry that we get from orchards in the, on the Golan Heights. We've got a mulberry uh, kind of funky little looking spoon. Again, this is a um, leftover piece from, from one of my students that was carving a, a bigger spoon and I just grabbed it and I was like, oh, maybe I could do something um, out of that. Uh, we have a loquat, which is a really nice wood for carving. This is a little coffee scoop. It's really, really nice. I enjoy making these. I usually tend to have an asymmetrical design from the outside, but a very round bowl on the inside. And that plays very nicely with the eye, in my opinion, of course. With the cooking uh, spoons, I think this is kind of one of those um, Yoav El Kayam uh, designs and it, it just works really well you know especially for a spatula this is cypress and I enjoy it I enjoy carving cypress a lot but I enjoy this shape very much I feel like you know my kitchen is full of spatulas that look like this or cooking spoons that look like this and it just it makes perfect sense to me um, often people say oh Mikey is this split down the middle I'm like, no, this, it's just, you know, it's intentionally, it looks like this. And I think these are really kind of, uh, they catch the eye, they're, they intrigue people. So it's, it's out of the ordinary. And that's what kind of makes it, I think, special. Um, I do like to occasionally carve a bigger spoon. I think a few years back, Barn um, had purchased one of my ladles and, and he's, he's done a video on that. So it's kind of a similar... Uh, ladle spoon and I enjoy them and I usually tend to try and make them look like they're an eating spoon just in big. Um, I do occasionally carve the miniature spoons and you know we're gonna put them on the necklace for the mayor of Spoontown Mrs. Jill Swan and I enjoy I enjoy carving that a lot um, um, and in the previous years, I've mostly been more um, passionate about turning cups, of, again, taught to me by Yoav, and just really trying to, to you know, learn and follow some of his footsteps and, and really, you know, 
small footsteps for me at least so I've been turning quite a bit these are some bowls that I turn as part of demonstrations um, they're not the nicest uh, finished bowls but because the wood was very very dry but I really enjoy you know turning the smaller bowl and that's great for like olives or for just like a tahini dressing or you know some cut up vegetables and, and we use them a lot. One last thing that uh, is on this table and, and I think it's kind of, I see myself as a teacher more as a constant maker. So I'm, I do more teaching during the year than I do making. And I'm trying to get people into understanding how grain works and it, it's a difficult task that I've taken. I don't always succeed. Another thing is I'm really passionate about crank and getting that crank right and getting a flow that's correct. So I've made these templates and we call them side templates. They're really, really nice. And I try to encourage people to carve a really, really nice spoon, their nicest spoon, and then split it in half. And, there, and then they have a template for a really nice spoon that they've carved. And I think they're, they're gaining two things. The one thing is that they're gaining the fact that they are letting go of material. In other words, they've carved a really nice spoon and then they've split it in half. And that's kind of part of that agenda of it's not about the spoon, it's about learning. And the second thing that they're gaining is that they're gaining a, a better understanding about, of grain direction. And they're also gain, gaining a template that they can keep. And the thing about that is I'm, I'm very much opposed to all of the plastic templates that people are producing these days especially you know the laser cut templates if, if you're going to reuse uh, plastic that's one thing but if you're going to um, cut using a laser machine and you need to buy new sheets of plastic I think we have enough plastic in in our lives at the moment and you can always make <coughs> really cool templates out of wood as well so um, yeah it's just just a uh, quick teaching devices that I bring with me and I, I try and get people to use them and make their own. And that's that's really it. That's all I've brought with me this time around. I, in the past I have done some elephant uh, spoons and, and yesterday I actually um, tried to make another. Um, yeah, so beginning of an attempt. I don't know if it's going to work out. Yeah, that looks really lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So in this video then, what spoon are you going to be well, demonstrating? Well, I, I, think, I think I'd like to just show a simple uh, kind of eating spoon with an asymmetrical end of the bowl and, and the corresponding edge on the end of the handle. And maybe if we get to it, we'll do this little notch um, that I do and just kind of the understanding of how it's supposed to look and where I position it. And the fact that the, the handle still feels centered to the bowl although there is kind of like an added on section for that notch. So Mike, we're beginning the process. Where would you like to start? Um, so I just have a, a quarter piece of cherry, really nice cherry that they brought in for this event. And I've chosen a radial um, kind of slice of wood and I'm gonna make spoons out of these as well, but I'm gonna put them aside. I really like the two-tone that I can get from cherry and as you notice it does run through the whole piece of wood. I really enjoy carving radial, um, radially as opposed to tangentially and I think I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting more of that wood texture in the spoon so I, I enjoy it a lot although every now and then I will do kind of that tangential cut where we're getting those, those um, growth rings. So yeah, that's really it. This is about 20 centimeters long piece of wood. And I've, what I've done is I've just squared it out just really quickly. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of prepare it for putting in a crank. And should I get going? Yeah, sure. All when right. you're ready. Yeah. So I've brought it down to the width that I'd like and I'm, and I'm kind of in the constant attempt to keep the two-tone uh, balanced. So I don't want to take off too much of this sapwood. 
and I definitely don't want to take off too much of this um, uh, heartwood, which is really, really nice. So I'm, I'm leaving it kind of wide at the moment, and when we get closer to the actual spoon, then we're going to narrow it down. I'm starting from the back end, and so this is where the spoon is going to be, and I'm starting by just giving it a quick kind of change of direction, It's what I like to call it, in that direction. And I'm going to actually push it back just a bit further and that's going to be the marker for where my crank is going to start on the other end, on the other side of this blank. And I think it is really important to talk about this axe. Uh, this axe is made by Lian Israeli, and he's one of those uh, partners of mine back in Tivon, back where I live in. And he made this axe for me, who knows how many years ago. I think it, it's soon coming up to about 10 years ago. Um, and it's just a beautiful, gorgeous axe that's, that, that he makes. It's his carving axe. I, I love it. I, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, I guess, I'm biased when it comes to to it. So that's going to be our change of direction. I'm just going to fix it up ever so slightly. I, I love working standing up as opposed to sitting down. It gets my whole body into, into the actual work. And at this point what I can do is I'm going to put in that change of direction cut for the crank. I know people do it with the saw. But the thing is, I can resharpen my axe at any given time. And I know this does dull the axe just ever so slightly. So as I was saying, I can resharpen my axe, but to resharpen the saw constantly, I think, is almost impossible. So I've made that V-notch for where my crank is going to be. And if I just get one of those templates, I think... That can probably explain ever so slightly what it is I'm trying to do. And students can uh, draw that shape on and that will kind of help them understand the sideline for the carving. And we're going to try and make that double crank today as well. Whereas the top of the handle has kind of like a little bit of a wavy flow to it. People often uh, say, oh, that's kind of like a dolphin spoon. I think it's, it's less accentuated than the do dolphin spoon, which I, I've never found <laughs> to be very pleasing to use the, uh, the dolphin spoons. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to work into that initial cut and work down into that V. I'm trying to stop right before I get there. And then the next part is, is one of my favorite parts for uh, of carving. So I'm going to use the tip of the axe, or what we call the toe, to get rid of this, this part. I guess you can do it this way, but that feels a little bit unsafe. So if I put it down and I'm grabbing the piece of wood I'm, and I bring it to the edge of my block, I could really work my way through, kind of side cutting the piece. And I'm just working into that V cut. And I'm going to go back now to just kind of perfect that line. And I, I just do it from one side. I know that there's some people who flip it out through the process. I just, I don't need it. As long as the edge of the <coughs> bowl is supported on the bottom end, hand of the block, then I'm not afraid of kicking out any pieces. So that's kind of there where we're at. And what now what I'm going to try and do is just quickly create somewhat of a corresponding 
line on the other on the other side on the bottom side for the crank and I'm just going to do that quickly I can do it in an, a uh, what we call a um, an edge kind of method whereas I'll go against the edge every time and work my way around but um, seeing this cherry is kind of soft I could just go at the whole surface at once without having to worry too much quick bump cut Yeah, and I feel like that's kind of where we want to be. And especially if we're gonna make kind of that uh, flow shape. So I've left this a little bit thicker than I would for just a kind of normal eating spoon. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so instead of, instead of this spoon coming down straight from the crank and there, therefore I could have left this a little bit thinner what we're going to try and do is have that little kind of uh, divot coming in over here. I find that to be very comfortable in the hand. So you're thinking about the usability of the spoon once it's complete? I'm, I'm very much about ergonomics. I, I really enjoy um, holding something that kind of fits in your hand perfectly. You pick it up and you're like, oh, that's, that's really... That, that's really um, ergonomic. It feels natural in the hand. I think kind of that's what some of us as spoon carvers, that's what we're looking for, for, for our customers to pick up a spoon and say, oh man, that's, that just fits perfectly in my hand. I, I have to buy it or I have to have it. Um, I think it's, it's kind of a cross, spoon carvers are kind of a cross breed between, you know, kind of product engineers and woodworkers and artists. It's kind of a mixture of all those worlds. So what I usually do at this point is I'll draw in my, um, my shape that I'm looking for. As I said earlier, I don't use any templates. Um, and what I'll generally do is I'll um, just use my hands and my eyes to get what I want going. Uh, I'm looking for just a simple center line. I have the bottom of my hand supported. Maybe I'll move this axe out of the way. So I have the bottom of my hand supported. And I'll just try and get that center line. Do we need maybe a different, different pencil? So what I like to do is just draw in kind of a quick center line. And again, I'm trying to train my eyes and my hands to, to see the symmetry that I'm looking for. And therefore, I do not use a ruler. I don't use um, any kind of template. And I think it's really important to have the bottom of your hand grounded. And what I'll do now is just put in, sorry, I'll just put in that front end uh, arc. So uh, obviously this is gonna be a right hand eating spoon. And I do occasionally make a lefty. Another thing I'll do is put in the corresponding arc so they're, they're kind of like uh, matching. And then what I'll do is I'm going to go in to the back end of the spoon. And obviously this is going to, this looks like it's turning into pretty big either. Um, we can always uh, bring it down afterwards in size. That's kind of um, where we're going to start from. And uh, then, yeah. Just, just one thing as you're doing that, would you encourage those that are watching to practice the freehand drawing? Yes, I, I do. I think, I think when we start using different um, instruments to help us draw things, then we're not training our hands or our, our eyes to do with the things that we'd like to do. And I think that causes a lot of time of frustration. And then people kind of forget about the drawing business of drawing out a spoon. If you're going to try and design your own spoon, then I think it's, it's a good thing to train your eyes and your hands to, to get that design in the piece of wood without your templates. So don't, don't put aside the drawing part, you know, just kind of practice it and get that honed in 
and then I, I think I feel like it's given me so much to 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 constantly um, I guess try and try again to get the the shapes that I'm looking for and, and worth noting that you switch to a watercolor pencil yes so the wood here is very very wet and um, yeah and that's just a that this is just a rough a rough rough shape that that you know at some point we're gonna erase using our knives and we're just gonna you know we're, we're gonna follow this now we're probably gonna get it a tiny bit smaller I really like having that back end of the bowl rounded um, but it's definitely way too big for an eating spoon so the first thing we're gonna do is something I call a mummy shape we're gonna bring down <coughs> this whole part and the way I do it is just getting in, introducing some quick kind of separation cuts into that grain and I'm gonna do every time I'm just gonna do the same side And then I'm going to do the same for this side. So quick separation cuts into that heartwood. And then getting that mummy shaped in. I think this is a key step for any kind of spoon carving. Getting rid of the wood that doesn't need to be cut down accurately. And then kind of that's where we are. What now I can do is I'm going to try and get rid of the material here and the connection between bowl and handle. What I'll often do is put the spoon on the side and then kind of separate that. I call this often a half V cut because I'm doing half of the V. I'm trying to come down straight on one end and then I'm in there. I'm quite away from the back end of my bowl and then I'm just going to get rid of this part over here and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start with the bowl underneath the axe but at some point I'm going to bring this down. Again I'm working with that tip of the blade so if I miss I'm not going into the bowl I'm going into the axe block. So it's kind of slanted downwards. I'm pinching the spoon with my left hand so that it's out of the way. And I'm just working with that tip of the axe to get rid of that part. I tend to say to people, do one side and then the other. Um, don't try and work simultaneously on, on the shoulders coming into that neck. So let's do the other side now. So that's going to be our half V cut right there. And then again, I'm going to start the cut above the spoon, above the bowl, and then I'm going to slant it downwards so that my range of motion is into the block in case I miss. And this heartwood is a little bit on the hard side. There we go. Let me see. Maybe. There we go. Yeah, and I think it's about getting as close to the lines as you can at this point with the axe. Uh, it saves a lot of time later on with the knife work. Then again, there are people who say to me, you've, you've perfected my axe work so much, I don't enjoy carving anymore. And I'm like, why is that? And they're like, all, all I wanted to do is sit down with a knife and carve. And suddenly that's become <coughs> um, a smaller part of their work. So I think the axe is really important in that way. So I've perfected those lines and what I'm going to do now is now that I have that area I can lean on it Yeah 
So I've come back towards that line. I'm going to do the same here. And that's kind of where we are at this point. So once I've come quite close, well, I can get over here with the sap with, I can get a little bit closer. So once I've come quite, quite close to the lines I'm looking at, I'm going to start and try to get rid of um, the edges on the bottom end. So until now I was thinking two dimensional, now I'm starting to think three dimensional. Now I'm going to thin this down just a little bit as well. Yeah, there we go. So, I mean, at this point, <coughs> I, I'm, this is, I, I think trial and error is a big thing and quality assurance is also QA. You're constantly doing QA. So I've, I looked at this once I'm, you know, kind of working with the X, I'm like, oh, that's a little bit too big to my liking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow my original lines, but just bring them in about five or six millimeters, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm just making it ever so slightly smaller. I need to do the same with the front end of the spoon because I want the proportions to kind of stay um, the same in that way. So, and then I'm going to bring the neck in as well. And I can, I could do this with the knife, but I am going to do it with the ax. Whereas I'm going to try and get closer to those new lines that I've just created. And I could bump cut my way through. I could do the same in this direction and just kind of bump cut my way through. So I'm getting kind of that very precise cut without um, endangering the spoon. And that's much, much better already. I can notice I'm, I'm happier with the way, with making it smaller ever so slightly. And then really what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off. I can do it with the saw, but I, I don't mind doing it with the axe as long as the other end is supported. And I'm actually not going to go all the way through. I'm going to stop over here and then come back from the other direction and cut it at a slant so that I'm not tearing out any of that end grain. I'm going to do the same for the handle. I'm using that, you know, kind of carpenter's mark. So I'm going to thin down the handle just a bit. So that I'm getting the, the kind of corresponding thinness that I'm looking for in the spoon. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And just one last thing I'm going to do with the X is again, I'm going to take down these ridges. And just make sure the bottom end of my spoon is just the way I want it. So again, I'm going to take down, I call these the horns. I'm going to take down the horns. And that's really it. So thickness wise, 
I'm happy. I might <clears throat> end up shortening the spoon just ever so slightly. And that's really it when it comes to the axe work. So one final question before we move on to the knife work. This is a question I've, I, I've asked, uh, um, I've seen commonly asked. Yeah. Is, so when you say a right-handed asymmetrical spoon, why is a right-handed asymmetrical spoon, why, why is that different than, let's say, a normal symmetrical spoon? Well, so if I'm, if I'm scraping the bottom part of the bowl, this is the movement that I'm going to do. So that kind of corresponds with the shape of bowls or plates. And if I do this with my left hand, I'm leaning on the corner because of the design of the spoon. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So I'm yep. lean, leaning on that, that corner as opposed to kind of that movement being done. I feel like, um, I think it's a really cool thing that we can do with wood. So Mikey, with the axiom finish, what's next in the process? What I'll do now is I'll try and trace my um, outline design. So what we call the upper view or plain view. And I'm just going to try and get to that shape with the knife. This is a knife made by Avinoam Leber from Israel. It's a beautiful, beautiful blade handled by myself um, in like a curly eucalyptus. I don't know if the camera could see it. It's really, really nice uh, for handles. And the blade is just completely uh, unbelievable. It's an amazing blade. So I'm going to start off with the kind of what we call the potato peeler cut. And um, what I'm going to try and do is get the shape that I'm looking for, the plain view shape. Some thumb cuts as well, just to get rid of that corner or thumb push cuts, sorry. And now I'm going to work my way around the spoon to just get kind of the, the um, outline that we drew into the spoon. Before I could make any changes to the original design, I'm going to try to get exactly where I wanted to be. Um, and then I'm going to show you how I'm going to make those changes. So a little bit of a reinforced sternum grip. I'm going to cut these away as well. Every now and then I'm just going to take a look to see that I'm in the right direction that I'm interested in being in. And yeah. And I seem to, to um, unpurposely try and work on areas symmetrically. So in other words, if I'm going to be on this side of the, of the bowl, I'm going to move to the other side of the bowl. The same goes with the handle. So if I'm working on this end, I'm going to try and flip that over to work on that end. And um, yeah, so I'm definitely in the direction I want to be in. I'm now um, going a little bit on the brave side and cutting closer to those pencil marks. And I guess in a way, I'm gonna get rid of them at some point. So yeah. And really, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna move to the next stage of thinking about the three-dimensional spoon before I'm really happy with my plain view, and that and that might take a while. Again, just this end piece, I'm gonna use a thumb push. I think another another really important thing is with knife work is that you use both hands almost in the same. Um, in the same uh, intensity. So my left hand, although it's, it's holding the spoon, it's directing the knife throughout most of the cuts and it's moving the, the knife or the spoon in the direction we want it. So I'm actually quite pleased with the outline of this spoon, with the plain view. 
I'm also quite pleased with the thickness that we've left here in, in this dimension because we're gonna we're gonna actually do kind of that um, that little notch that I do and interestingly enough the next part of what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna erase my design my original design and I believe strongly that by doing this I'm training my eyes to see the shape that I'm interested in and if there's still pencil lines in there then what's happening is that um, my eyes are attracted to the pencil lines and not so much to the shape that I'm, I'm looking to create if that makes sense I, I, I don't know if it does yeah but and then I'm gonna bring this down and kind of get that curve really really set out with the way I want the spoon to look down the middle as well and it's interesting because usually people will say to me well why are you doing this in the middle of the bowl if this is material material that you're going to be um, taking out when you hollow out the bowl and I feel like it is important to get those cuts really really nice and to get that this bottom of the bowl exactly the way we want it and what this is, has done is it's kind of shown me where my imperfections are because beforehand all I was doing is looking at at the uh, pencil marks and now I can actually see the shape the first thing that comes to my eye is the fact that this over here if you can see it it comes out further so this line is not straight and what I'll do is I'll bring that in just a little bit more and 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 this is a really important place to start kind of perfecting that design especially you know the desi design I'm interested in so I've just I've I've quite quickly fixed you know that problem that I had so now the lines they add up so that these shoulders they're you know kind of at the same place yeah and another thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start getting you know those arches that I really enjoy and like I'm just gonna get them in I used to do more of this corner I don't like it so much these days so what I'll do is I'm just gonna round off that end and then get more of that arc also from this side as well and what it does is it widens the um, end of that bowl just a little bit which is really really nice for scooping up food into your mouth that is what we're doing we're making a tool for eating so I've kind of perfected the bowl where I'd like it to be and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it I will do some more perfecting to the bowl later on in my process but now I'm going to start thinking about the handle now I carry I carry a, a small ruler not for design but sometimes I'll demonstrate to people how proportions are really important when you're carving a spoon so right now the length of my handle I can see that it's too long for what I'm trying to do but more importantly what I'll talk about many times is the bowl at the widest point right now is about four and a half centimeters which is about as wide as I would go for an eating spoon and the bowl is what's going to determine the rest of the spoon for me so if that's four and a half centimeters I have this very strange uh, rule whereas the, the handle at the widest part should not be more than half of the width of the bowl if that makes sense so if if you go around now to some of the famous carvers that have arrived here at Spoonfest or sorry Spoontown if you go around here and 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 look at some of the spoons of these famous carvers that are have arrived at Spoontown you'll see that they have uh, their their spoons usually correspond with this simple rule whereas the width of their bowl is going to be <clears throat> about double 
the width of the handle at the widest point. And here we're at about 2.6 centimeters. And if our bowl is four and a half, we want to be at about 225 and not anywhere near that. So one thing that we can do is we can go back to our pencil and just draw out a simple line down the handle. And often what I'll do is if I like the shape right now that's happening is I'll kind of just um, carpenter mark it in the direction that I want it to go. And then I'm going to go back to the ruler and kind of check if, if we're good. And that's two centimeters wide, so that's good. We don't want to go above. We can definitely go under half of that distance. And that's really, really nice. Another thing is, <clears throat> is I'm going to now determine the length of my, of my spoon. And it would be a really good time to cut it down to length. I will do that with a saw. So what saw are you using there? Um, this is just a pruning arse uh, saw made in Japan. I don't know if you guys can get them here. But we need to be careful how we pronounce uh, Oh, arse. sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. A-R-S. A-R-S. Yeah, there we I go. Think, I think there's no other way to pronounce that. Arse, yeah. <laughs> It's just really nice. It's small. Um, I never got into the, um, into the um, uh, what's that brand? Silky. Silky saws. I think um, it might, might be a little bit uh, not nice to say, but I think they're overpriced for, for what they are. They're just a saw. These are, are just as good, and they're, I think, maybe a third, if not a quarter of the price. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and yeah, I can, you, you could get these in the... Um, uh, in, in just like simple uh, um, hardware stores in Israel. And they're really, really good. They, they are. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna come down to those, to those lines that I've recreated. And again, the reason I'm leaving this uh, a bit chunky in this dimension is because again, we're gonna come in down and up uh, to get that divot for the for our uh, finger. And another thing I could do is I could chamfer this edge and come as close as I can to that pencil mark and then just from the side, because I can't see the pencil mark from the side, I could see that chamfer and kind of work to disappearing the chamfer and that way I know I'm in the right direction. I could do the same in this grip over here and just come at it really, really slowly. And that's, you know, and that's a really good way to kind of trace those pencil marks and lines. And I think it's really important for me, at least, to say that the whole idea of getting that kind of double crank in is really, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't feel original in anything that I do. Um, I think it's all ideas that I've taken over the years. And I think many carvers do from different carvers. Um, and I'm really inspired by some of Derek Sanderson's spoons. I've got a bunch of them. I think he's probably my, one of my top three carvers. And I think the ergonomics that he's put into his spoons are just fabulous and amazing. Who, yeah. Who, you got to be curious now. Who are the other two? <laughs> <laughs> you're, just top three. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're just setting yourself up here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think they're all, they're all kinds, but I think, a big inspiration for me is, is Will St. Clair, uh, Barn and, and Yoav. I think they're all really, really big inspirations to some of the designs that they've come up with throughout the years and, and just doing uh, things the way they've done. So I'm now moving to a place where I'm really comfortable with starting to work on the three-dimensional 
part of the spoon. And the first thing is, is I'm going to sort the back end of the bowl just ever so slightly. And what I'm trying to do is rounding it off so that I'm getting kind of that rounded look that I want from the bottom end of the bowl um, before I work the handle into it and before I take out material. I know it's kind of um, counter uh, intuitive and also counter to what other greenwood uh, workers are doing whereas they'll take material out of the bowl first and only then move to the bottom of the bowl. I feel like I really want to hone in on where I want the bowl to be and I can control how much material I'm taking out of the top, but the bottom part of the bowl is what, you know, is important. That's what you're feeling in your mouth when you're eating. So I really, it's important for me to get that really right and the way I want it. Another thing is I'm gonna just str straighten out that bottom end just ever so slightly so that it's easier for me to do the next part. So <clears throat> if, if we can imagine that now coming in here, does that look good? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. And so what we're gonna try and do is bring this down. I can also, I can also just um, kind of draw this in and so it's just a quick wave. And the way to do it is actually quite awesome, in my opinion, is I'm going to dip that tip of the blade in and then just come out and follow down till the bowl. And I've created a straight chamfer. I'm going to do the same on the other side. Yeah, and then all I have to do is follow those ridges through the center down into here. And I'm just giving it a quarter of a turn every time. And again, we're still quite thick at the, um, at the neck end because we're going to put in that notch. So we're keeping that for, for later. And what we've done now is we've created that cut in to, to get that kind of, um, I guess, divot for the thumb when you hold the spoon. And what we're going to do now is we're, we're just going to trace. And I think this is the most important part. And we're just going to trace that end to correspond with the um, cut that we've created downwards. And that's going to make the whole difference um, with the way the spoon looks and feels in the hand. And again, I'm, I'm doing a ridge, ridge work. I've created the ridge in the, in the center. And now I could round it off towards the end. And then I have this kind of um, step here, so I'm gonna just get that. Where I want it. And that's really the way it looks. It's still very bulky and very thick, but that would be an amazing place to, to now start out with. Thinning things down, getting things the way we want them. I'm just gonna get that back um, arc in that corresponds with the front end. So I'm kind of looking at this corner and you know that that's that's what they're corresponding with. Yeah and then so I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that this is beginning to look and this is exactly the point where I would put down the, my carving knife. 
So Mikey, what's next in the process? So I'm, I'm gonna hollow out the spoon, but I'm not actually gonna hollow out the spoon um, as a finishing cut just yet. I'm just gonna remove some material material from the in, 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 uh, from the inside of the bowl so that I could work on the lip or on the edge of the uh, bowl. What, what I use is a, a simple, um, I think they're called tuca cams. I, I don't know how to pronounce them from Nick Westerman. This is, uh, I think, an earlier one of his. And what I'll do is I'll just, I'm, I'm turning with my right hand and directing the knife with my uh, left hand's fingers. And what I'm trying to do is just get rid of some material from the middle of the spoon. And obviously for those that are watching that don't have this particular tool, yeah. just use whatever spoon knife they have. Yeah, 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 yeah. just use whatever spoon knife you have. Um, I, I have a tendency to uh, just use two spoon knives, this one and the one I'll show you in a moment uh, to just kind of finish off what I'm doing. And that, those are the two um, spoon knives that I use to, to carve spoons. I don't think you need a lot more than that. Um, so I've, I've taken uh, quite a bit out. This is another uh, Nick Westerman um, faucet, I think they're called faucet blades. This is a nice cover that I've made. And what I'll do now is I'm just going to kind of work my, my way around getting rid of some of that material. I'm just checking to see that I'm in the right thickness that I'd like to be. Yeah. And essentially uh, eating spoons, they don't need to be so deep so I'm not going in that deep I'm just I'm just kind of getting to where I'd like to be at this point yeah and this cherry is is amazing it's really really nice to carve but it is a bit too uh, wet for really getting in a good a good finished cut um, and so, so I am going to have to kind of put this aside and then I've got a spoon that looks just like it that we could finish. Um, that's already dry. Just as you're finishing that off, one question I forgot to ask you yeah. earlier on in the video is yeah. um, also for my education, but what woods are popular in Israel for carving spoons with? Um, so we don't have the uh, kind of wild f uh, forests that you guys have here. Um, not as much. We do have some oak forests where we live and most of the trees that we're using are planted uh, trees either f you know for domestic kind of uses so they get planted for shade or in different parks um, and a big majority of the uh, wood that we use up north comes from different orchards so um, cherries and apple and pear and avocado wood is something I use a lot for teaching and just you know kind of general um, orchard trees that that um, that we use um, so it's very very different from here we don't have wild cherries that grow and most of the trees that grow are, are I guess um, much much smaller than they are he here it's just a different different environment so it's, it's much um it's, it's very much different um, and would i be right in saying it's, it's, it's harder as well typically yeah most of the woods that i work with are much harder than the woods here um if it's almond wood or plum wild plum some cherry uh a lot of these woods are are woods that get um watered so it's a different it's kind of a complete different environment for them and they grow very much differently. I do work a lot with Alipo oak when I have a chance to, to work with it, which is probably probably the most amazing uh, wood that we have in Israel to work with, in my opinion, of course. It's very much like beech, and it carves very, very much like beech. It's a really beautiful looking oak, and I, I really love it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm crazy about it. 
and it's the trees that are all around us where, where I live. And then how do you typically source the woods? Um, I, I, I've, so over the past like 10 years, I've been bugging all kinds of different arborists and, and different um, orchard workers. And now what's happened is they'll call me and they'll say, you know, Mikey, we're taking down this big lot of, of maybe 20 or 15 trees. Would you like to come and, and get them? And that's kind of agriculture, right? It's just the way it works is, um, you know, they're now, um, you know, just changing around things. So, uh, and they'll call me up and they'll say, you know, Mikey, come in, just grab a bunch of trees and, and, and you know, I, I, I'll usually give them a spoon or two as a gift and, and that's it. It's, it's become a relationship over the years. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no worries. So what we're going to do now is <laughs> I'm just going to uh, get that edge sorted in the spoon so I'm, I'm gonna work on on the lip I guess is what we call it of the of the bowl I'm just taking it taking it off slowly and I mean and that's kind of where I'd really like to be there is some perfecting as I said earlier there's some perfecting to be done in the actual outline of the bowl um, so there, there are some higher spots and lower spots, and I really, I put a lot of time into getting these arcs really nice, <clears throat> nicely in tune. They, they, they want to look like each other, and if they don't, that can really bug my eyes. Um, and then next thing would be is I'm going to start working on the bottom half of the spoon, and I'm going to start pulling, kind of the shape that I'm looking for and I, I really enjoy a rounded bottom to the spoon it kind of plays nicely so you can play with it in your hands and the way to do that again very similar to what we did on top is I'm gonna take start off with the corners I'm gonna bring them in as much as I can as close as I can to that top surface and then I'm going to do the same with the other side. And I'm kind of just trying to follow the top part of the spoon, the top end uh, surface. And what I've created is I have this now, this really dense ridge. And what I can do is I can work down from the neck of the bowl into there and that's what that's how I'm getting that wave and once I get to this back end what I'm going to start doing is start rounding it off so I had I made those ridges earlier I'm just going to round round them off and I'm trying as hard as I can to get this in one one cut and that's going to make my life easier when I come to finish the spoon, is if they're less kind of, um, I guess, short, shallow cuts and more long, deeper cuts, then that's kind of what, what I'm looking for when I want to come to finish the spoon. And then I'm going to work the back end of the bowl into, into the neck. Again, I'm still going to leave this uh, part quite thick um, just because we're going to put in that, that little notch that I've been doing lately. So I'm, I'm still, um, I have that in mind. And I think that's another really good tip for, for beginners or people who've, who are intermediate and starting to carve eating spoons and thinking about kind of their own designs is if you have an, a design intention 
um, and and it's it's more su suitable for those finishing uh, cuts in the spoon. Then you just have to keep that in mind constantly, and just keeping keep thinking about when you're going to incorporate it and how you're going to incorporate it. And I think that's really important um, to kind of just think about think think those things over. Yeah. So, and I was saying earlier about this this pencil, the um, the watermark watermark pencils. Is that what they, uh, they're called? Watercolor pencils. Watercolor pencils. Is that um, I don't like them as much because they just leave so much, um, they make the spoon so dirty. So I'm just getting rid of some of those, some of that um, dirt. It gets on your hands and it gets uh, smeared. Is there a better word for that, for smeared? Yeah, no, no, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So again, I'm just working the handle to get to get it nice and rounded. And the thickness that I'm looking for. And at this point, I think um, there's, there's not a lot of methodology, at least not in my, um, not, not in my book. Um, it's more about kind of making those stops and reassessments where I'm going to look at the spoon and, and say, all right, what needs to be done now and, and kind of feel it in my hands and, you know, just get, get the feeling of, all oh, right, this area is not where I want it to be. So I'm going to work on that for a little bit. And again, going back to assessing constantly um, where it is you need to, you know, kind of improve and holding it in, in your hand and feeling it out. So I think we're kind of at that point where I'm going to implement the, uh, a little bit of a design feature and, and probably the right thing to do is to put this down right after that um, and let it dry just a little bit and then kind of come back to it in a couple days or weeks um, to to finish it off. And, but, and and for those that are not familiar, why that is, could you explain a little bit? So for those that are a little bit um, new to so carving. just on the on 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 really really simple um, and and um, I think <clears throat> when the wood is still really high on moisture level, so if there's a lot of moisture still in this uh, piece of wood it's going to be really hard to finish the spoon. We actually want it dry, maybe not bone dry, but we want it dry so that the fibers are a little bit more, I guess they densify as they dry. So they shrink and therefore there's less moisture in them and therefore they're getting a better tool finish when it comes to using these tools. So if that, I mean, if that makes sense, I guess there's a really good way to explain it, but um, I hope I don't offend anyone with uh, when when uh, game meat is being um, butchered or maybe uh, processed. Processed. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Then obviously there's still a lot of moisture in the meat, and and usually it's a good thing to let it sit and, and dry for a little bit, and then it, it actually densifies just ever so slightly. And that's kind of, it makes it easier to process. I'm sorry about it for all the um, vegans out there. <laughs> and we could cut that out of, of the, in the edit if, if, yeah. Anyway, so what we're going to do now is I've left this area much, much thicker than it should be in comparison to a finished um, spoon. And the reason for that is, is I'm going to try <clears throat> and make that, uh, notch like here but I want to keep the fact that the the handle will be uh, centered with the actual bowl of the spoon so let me, let's see um, how we're gonna do that it, it's usually something that's gonna happen in this direction what I'm doing is I'm putting the tip of my blade in and I'm turning it 
like a screwdriver. So I'm, I'm turning it as if I would turn a screwdriver and I'm just getting that kind of notch, uh, um, concave notch. And let me, let's get it even deeper than it is right now. There we go, that's really, really nice. And this blade is just fantastic. Again, shout out to um, Avinoam Leber. I think he's called uh, Dudat Knives on uh, Instagram. And, and he's now, he's a young maker, just seriously talented. Yeah, and there's a lot of really talented carvers in Israel over the years. Um, you know, mostly part of Oren's group. Uh, you know, Oren's created a really small, beautiful community around him. He's done an amazing, amazing job with his spoon club. And people come every Friday to carve with Oren. And there's a festival that he runs as well, which is really, really nice um, to see. You know, in comparison to like 10 years ago, where there were just about three of us in Israel carving spoons. Now, I think we're up to, to a few dozen. And Oren, for those that are not familiar, his surname? Uh, Oren Hetzroni, and he's known as uh, Hetzronio on, on um, Instagram. Uh, yeah, go ahead and, and, and follow him. And the um, name of his festival, do you know what it is? Uh, yeah, it's called Festi Kaf, which is, translates to Spoonfest in Hebrew. Ah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a very original name. And uh, what it is is a... Festi, festival in, in Hebrew is actually a festival. Uh, so there's, that's the Israeli word for it. So we've carved that little notch in. And what we're going to do is to accentuate it, I'm going to come in back of it and then just kind of like get a concave cut behind that part of it. Do you see that? Yep. And then we're going to just kind of round off this end. And then round off the other end. And by doing, by doing so, what we've done is we've gave the spoon kind of a feeling that is very, the, uh, the handle and the neck are very symmetrical with the bowl. But at the same time, we've done this little asymmetrical kind of, um, I guess, add-on to it, or finial. I'm not sure it's a finial, um, but is, is that coming through? Okay. Yeah, looking good. All right, perfect. And then I've noticed that this needs some rounding. And over here, this needs some rounding as well. Yeah. So Mikey, what's next in the process? So um, I'm 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 quite pleased with the with this spoon. I mean, if I do a quick kind of Q and A, then I think the handle might have come out a little bit too long um, to my liking. So I might shorten that um, <clears throat> another day. But what's going to happen now is this is still quite wet, so it's going to go in my box of unfinished uh, spoons. And then I have another spoon uh, from Sycamore that's very similar to the spoon that we've just carved. Um, a little bit different. It is from a, a little bit more of a bent piece of, of wood uh, that they had here at the field. So the crank is, is a little bit um, more substantial. But that being said, I could finish this now and just kind of show a quick process of finishing. The, really the first thing I need to do is go wash my hands with soap and clean, clean my hands off, especially with sycamore. That's just like a really, um, it was really susceptible to uh, getting uh, dirty. Um, I, I stropped my finishing bed, which is one of those uh, Nick Westerman, I don't even know what they call these. It's one of these really, really sharpy, pointy Oh, was that, is it hewn and home? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Union hone. And what I'm going to start doing is just really, really carefully, I'm trying to, to I'm not going to try and change the shape of the spoon, but I'm just trying to kind of get those nice curls and really nice and long 
curls one side to the other and I'm starting to clean up the top face and I'm gonna try and be as metho method meth methodical methodical as I can thank you Zed um, but it doesn't always work often I'll see something that bugs me and I'll move from one part of the spoon to another but I'm gonna clean that top face from top to bottom as much as I can you know just kind of getting those really long and here's a really good example of kind of a soft wood. This is sycamore, as I've said. And back in Israel, if I was working on anything similar, I'd be uh, applying much more force. So kind of I'm feeling uh, where the wood is at. Yeah, and I'm just trying to get really, really nice long shavings um, and, and you're using a very tip of the blade aren't you I am I'm using the really uh, top third of the blade to get these cuts in and just to recap then so you're able to get these finishes because you let the spoon dry <laughs> yes yes so the 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 fibers have densified a lot more now that they have less um, fluids I guess less moisture in them and that's kind of what what makes for a really good finished spoon another thing we can do is just you know kind of brush our finger over this to see if 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 it's nice and um, I guess shiny or, or kind of that really nice feel that we're looking for from the wood um, again I think People who've seen your channel know that we, we don't use any kind of sandpaper on our spoons. So they're all tool finished. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do, is get a really nice uh, tool finish and a really nice, you know, kind of feel to the uh, spoon. If, you, if you're a, a, a spoon carving enthusiast, then there are all kinds of things that you can do now um, like um, burnishing, which is, I don't do any of that. I'm just looking for uh, simplicity at its best. So I'm looking to get really simple finishing cuts, and that's it. I don't do any burnishing of any kind, any baking. Um, all of those, that stuff is, is not, not my game. Yeah, and then I'm just going to start working on the edges. So that's kind of that, and then, and all I'm doing is cleaning up the different surfaces with the with the you know the least amount of cutting possible. And then I'm just gonna take off this corner and work that into here. I'm gonna do the same with this corner. And work that into there. And so once I've perfected the handle the way I want it, I'm going to move to the actual bowl and I'm going to first work. And this is what, this is now something that I call uh, a seesaw process. So I'm going to work on the rim of this bowl and then I'm going to actually go back into the bowl with the spoon knife. And for some that might look counter um, intuitive and also kind of repetitive work um, but what it is really is right now I'm, I'm giving <clears throat> I'm giving myself an outline for what it is I'd like to I'd like to do and then I'm gonna do this everything I've done just now I'm gonna do again um, after I finish the inside of the bowl so this might be a good time to do so 
And what I'm going to do is, right before, I'm going to grab one of these really nice uh, dowels that, that Sean Hellman makes. And I'm going to just drop my uh, spoon knife. This is a faucet spoon knife. I, I prefer this shape over all of the other shapes. I think it's the most versatile um, shape to have. Yeah. And then I'm just, I, I wipe it off with my shirt so that I'm not getting any of the uh, um, stropping compound on my spoon. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to start from the far end. And I'm just kind of working my way down till I come to that point of change of direction. Not really getting... the type of finishing cuts I'm looking for. Yeah. So this too also is still more on the wet side than it is on the on the dry side. And I could see that because the grain is a little bit on the I guess fluffy. Fluffy is definitely a, a scientific uh, word for what's happening here. Yeah. So I've now worked from, from this end till the point of direction. I'm now gonna place the spoon in between two fingers. It doesn't really matter which fingers. And I'm going to use the fingers from my other hand to help me kind of push that blade down into the cut until again I'm reaching that point of direction. Of change of direction, sorry. That point where the grain kind of changes its direction because we've implemented the crank into a semi straight piece of wood. And often what I'll do is I'll just try and get r rid of this um, part like that. But again, this is a, as I said, it's a seesaw process. I'm going to put this spoon knife down in a second and then come back to it soon once I've worked out the rim. Here we go, this is, the, the back end is taking a really nice finish, this part. Um, but the front end is not just there yet. <sighs> yeah, so I'm gonna put this, the spoon knife down, and now I'm gonna come back to the straight blade, and I'm just gonna kind of perfect the rim, so I've reached somewhat of a blade here. And and again, I'm going to have to do this cut at a 45 degree angle. I'm going to do the same here at a 45 degree angle. The, the thing with that is that I'm getting a top edge that at the end I'm gonna have to uh, cut as well. And then let's kind of perfect this, this arc over here. I'm gonna come till the end and stop and then I'm gonna come from the other way around just so that I don't upset the end grain fibers. And then so 
yeah, I guess I'm I'm semi pleased with with the way this bowl has kind of turned out. I think um, I probably could do a better job if I wasn't on film, and that's kind of my process for finishing the bowl. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move to the back end. So I started with the handle. I worked out kind of those uh, side edges. We moved to the bowl where we've kind of also perfected the shape of the bowl. And at the same time, we worked inside the bowl with our, with our um, spoon knife. And now what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is got, I'm going to move to the uh, bottom part of the spoon, the back end. And I've done like just a, a quick um, facets here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of clean them out so that um, they're really nice. And this isn't something I normally do, but it is every now and then if, if I get a, a piece of wood that is susceptible to it, then it's nice to, um, it's nice to get these done. This one as well, although this this edge is not is not having it more work in to the handle. This I like to do. I like to kind of try and follow this throughout the end of the handle. Okay, I'll do the other side first. To follow that as well and get it nice and even. Yep. And then and then what I'll do is I'll work here and then here and then kind of work this back facet into the bowl and this is a again the point of change of direction so I'm gonna have to be um, a bit more careful do you see these facets yeah just about yep yeah all right yeah. and then I'm gonna work back into the back end of the of the bowl of the sorry of the handle and and yeah and that's really nice it's worked out nicely <sighs> yeah and then just all I have to do now is kind of clean up the sides just a little bit. Clean up the ends. And this is again, this is kind of the tip work. So that's a corresponding arch with this arch. And then I'm just gonna kind of perfect the bowl ever so slightly. I'm gonna work out the bottom end so I'm just going to take off that corner. I think um, a finishing video is uh, completely uh, could be we could go on for days finishing spoons. There are spoons where I finish over the course of, of 10 minutes and then there are spoons I could finish over the course of, of two days so it's really I think it's it's about how anal I want to be um, in any given moment, I guess, um, about a certain finish. And it is at the end of the day, just, you know, for shoveling food into your mouth. So if it's not cutting you and if it's comfortable, then that, that will, that will work. Um, I am going to take off that top end of the blade. 
And it's always fun to see because it's a really, really tiny curl. <sighs> and it meets. Let's do another. Yeah, here we go. Got it the whole, whole way around. And then I'm going to just sever it from here. And yeah, and that's really, that's really it. It doesn't cut the roof of my lip and I can reach the back end with my top lip. And it's really nice, yeah. And this will get oil. Um, so actually talking about kind of the finishing aspects. Yeah. So drying, what's your personal process? I know obviously Israel, the climate is very different. Um, so kind of generally speaking, what is your process for drying? Um, I, I just keep it in that box of, of my spoons and it's more about when I have time, I'll come back to, to finishing spoons or around events, I'll, I'll clear some time in my schedule and come back to finishing spoons. So they can be in there for months at a time, but usually a week or two in Israel is, is, is perfect. Um, and then, yeah, and then, and then I'll do these finishing cuts and dry them out and that's really it. That's, that's you know, kind of where it ends. And finally, the oiling. What's your personal process oh, and preference for oiling? Yeah, dinosaur oil. Yeah, everyone's got their kind of um, um, crazy oil that they use. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of all of those discussions. I think, um, you know, the simple oils are really, really good if you use them. Uh, someone here last night was saying how they uh, oil their spoon uh, once a month for, for I, I don't know how long and then they wipe it off and then they oil it again and then the spoon dries out and over the course of two months. And I, I don't have the patience for that so I'll usually use either hemp oil or walnut oil. Uh, once walnut oil is cured, then it is not really um, uh, allergenic. So if someone's al uh, allergic to walnut oil, usually if, if the walnut oil is cured, then there's no problem with it. But I'm not a doctor, so be careful. Uh, but that being said, um, I'm, I, it's the simplest oil I can find. I, I kind of create my own wax uh, oil, so it's really good for your hands as well. And then, and then you're oiling your spoons and you're softening your hands a bit at the same time. I, I was wondering why you have such uh, smooth hands. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zed. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, and I, I'm all for being, you know, kind of that sustainable approach. So if you can get good oil and you know good beeswax from a local local uh, bee grower and then just kind of make your own finishing finishing oil and experiment with that i think that's that's the kind of the essence of spoon carving or green woodworking instead of buying things that come from you know overseas and and just buying oils and or constantly uh worrying about you know oils and finishing stuff um that's how we end up with with tons of of gear and i think i think i'm for myself i'm trying to kind of downsize that approach and just you know keeping it simple it's just a spoon it's definitely not about the spoon it's about other things and i think that approach of self-sustainability into green woodworking and spoon carving is the holistic approach of, of the way we want to live our lives and just before we do the actual outro, um, I'd like you to touch about your center in Israel, um, about if those are watching that are in Israel, would you like to talk a little bit about that? So we run a center that's called HaMerkaz LeMelachot Bayar in Tzivon. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, part of um, oak woodland forest. It's actually an ancient oak woodland uh, or oak forest. It's part of one of the two major forests that existed in Israel for thousands of years back. It's a really uh, beautiful place. And what we do is we encourage people to come in for workshops. We, want, we, we run a yearly course. So the yearly course is a group of people that join us every month for a weekend. Usually it's going to be two or three days. So Thursday through Saturday. And every weekend we touch on a different kind of craft. If it's, if it's spoon carving and cooks us, but at the same time, 
uh, they'll do blacksmithing and each will make his own kind of like finishing blade for carving. We do uh, weaving, so basket weaving. We've got a bunch of amazing teachers for basket weaving. Um, and they're just really, really excellent teachers. That's what it's all about. It's about, um, you know, kind of showing people craft, inspiring people to do more and more craft. We do felting as well. That's a really big craft that was once very, very common in Israel and it's, it's almost extinct. There are very few people who are still uh, doing or, or still felting the way we do. Most of the sheep's <coughs> of, of fur gets thrown away, um, literally into the trash. So it's, it's an abundant material um, and, and you can create the most amazing uh, shoes from felt or, or a hat or you know nice sweater for the, the winter. And our yearly course students, they actually create this beautiful tool roll with all kinds of different engravings on it uh, from felt. And so that's another thing that we, that we do. Um, and yeah, there's a raku burning of ceramics that happens in our Woodland Craft Center. So it's, it's just a multidisciplinary craft center that the whole idea is to get people engaged and inspired to do craft and to just be you know, in the forest, you know, we put our phones aside, we leave all of our troubles behind us and just, you know, kind of immerse ourselves in craft in the, in the forest. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Mikey. Oh, thank you very much, Zed, for having me. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. The, the, the honor is all mine, you know. I'm always yeah. incredibly grateful that people like yourself take the time out and are willing to share your information yeah. so that it may help and inspire others. One thing I forgot to mention at the very beginning, this is always very important for me that I mention, is that English is not Mikey's native tongue. No, it's not. Right? It's not. Um, so it's always very difficult, I know, for people who are not native English speakers to not only demonstrate what they're doing, but actually to explain things, especially with a camera in your face. Yeah. Right? It's very difficult. Personally, I think you've done incredibly well. Thank you. Um, Put it this way, your English is a lot better than my Hebrew, right? <laughs> right? So I always yeah. like to put things into perspective. So Mike, yeah, it's not his uh, native tongue. One thing I actually forgot to even ask you off camera is have you filmed on YouTube before? I think you've done I it. I do. So COVID was like really incredible for me. I started a, a YouTube channel, right. but it's all in Hebrew. Right. So for kind of like our local community, so people could just continue carving and getting lessons. It's completely, I mean, it's a completely free channel and, and anyone who speaks Hebrew uh, could pick up. And really interesting, last year we were at a Belgium festival and a, a guy approached me and he was like, you know, I owe my spoon carving to you. And I was like, how come? And he's like, well, I've, I've seen your YouTube videos. I was like, but they're in Hebrew. He's like, yeah, I just, I muted the, the sound and I learned from, you know, what you were demonstrating. Oh, wow. So it's really, really cool. I enjoyed making the uh, YouTube videos, but um, I, I didn't really, uh, I wasn't persistent with, with them. Uh, and then COVID kind of disappeared. <coughs> so I stopped, I stopped making those videos because, you know, I, I prefer people, meeting people in person yeah. and, and just, you know, uh, yeah, teaching, teaching that way. Yeah. And yeah, so it's, it's different. Israel's a very small place, so it's, it's, it just works out. But like, like you mentioned on video, uh, the community is flourishing. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in, in, in Israel, I've got a lot of subscribers who comment. But yeah, you guys are producing some really talented carvers. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm like, every so often I'll see someone like with, with obviously like a, 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 their name written in Hebrew. And they just do like incredible stuff. I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, do some really, really incredible stuff. So yeah. in the future, I have these guys, including Mikey, have invited me over to Israel. So when circumstances oh, and we'd logistics... Love, we'd love to have you, Zed. It, it would be yeah. an honor for me and just to come over and document yeah. the incredible scene they've got out there, which is absolutely flourishing. So kind of tying it back into this video now, uh, obviously Mikey has demonstrated his personal process for carving an asymmetrical spoon like you've seen over here. Uh, and hopefully we've, with the kind of aid of breaking down all the chapters, you can kind of come back to this video as a resource to kind of refer back to kind of section by section. Because obviously we can appreciate not everyone's just going to 
to follow it in one go, right? You're going to stop, you're going to pause, you're going to come back. And hopefully this video broken down into its relevant chapters will enable you to do that and take away some learnings from Mikey. Whether you're a complete beginner, intermediate, or even an advanced, you're always learning. So a few things to kind of wrap up on with this video. So number one, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a link below in the description to Mikey's personal Instagram, also his YouTube channel, and also I'm going to put a link to the website of the actual center yes. uh, that Mikey is part of uh, in Israel. And what we discussed just off camera as we were filming today is what we're also going to do in order to kind of help promote makers out in Israel. We're also going to put a link to a couple of the tool makers that Mikey has referenced in his video. I think it's very important that even especially for what I do on this channel over here is to support the many up and coming yeah. carvers and tool makers and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with your kind permission. Well, I'll... yeah, I mean, I think I think Avinam, um, um, who makes this this blade, I think he'd really appreciate. Yeah, he's a young, he's 19 years old. That's lunch. That was a, that's a spoon town signal for lunch. So we filmed at the right time. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but um, Avinam is 19 years old, and he's producing the most amazing uh, blades, spoon knives as well, and and Sloyd knives, and I think. It'd be really nice to give him a, a shout out. Yeah. And of course we have Leon, uh, who some of you know, and he's he's quite famous in the spoon carving community, and he makes the most amazing um, uh, spoon carving axes, that, and just in general axes. And he's he's probably one of the first people in Israel. He's been doing this for 14 years. Right. So making axes, which is very very uh, peculiar pe peculiar for someone in Israel to produce axes. So I think it's very important for me to give him a shout out. He's a really good friend and partner in my life as well. So yeah, I just appreciate the, the work he's done for some of us. And 100%, the yeah. links will be down below. And like I said, the makers were, I was unaware of up until recording <laughs> this video. So it'll be something for me to look into. But like I said, links to all of that below. And if there's anything else that we think of, once we've kind of wrapped up for the filming for today, links that we feel will be useful to you watching this video, then we're going to add those below. So like I said, just a final recap, this video has been broken down into all the different timestamps and those timestamps are down below in the description as well. That's for kind of easier reference as you move forward and use this video as an ongoing reference for yourself in your spoon carving journey. And like I said, every single link that we've referenced and more links in the future, we feel they will be useful, we'll put down below. Um, and obviously if you've got any questions or queries, you can you want to reach out to Mikey, would Instagram be, yeah, be yeah, a good place? Yeah, I think place? Instagram is the best place to reach out. Excellent. Um, and just before we actually do the wrap up, you wanted to mention a word about teaching in the UK. Well, so I, well, I think it's really important to understand for whoever's watching is that we've, we kind of created the Center for Woodland Crafts in Israel. Um, we almost mirrored uh, Brookhouse Woods. And because that's been such an inspirational place for us, we go there. I, I've gone there uh, many summers just to either visit or be an apprentice there for Will and Yoav, who've done a fantastic job and, you know, the bull gathering and all of the things that they do there. So if you're here in the UK and you're looking for a really intensive course to take they have the most amazing courses with the most amazing instructors and i feel it's really important for me because that place has been so inspirational for my work and both will and yoav have been the most amazing teachers for me i think it's important that people know that place exists and you can go on a course either for bowl turning or for for making those beautiful trays that jack wheeler is 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 making and just you know um get that immersive experience of a woodland craft center here in the UK. So you don't need to come all the way to Israel to, for hours. Oh, get... oh, oh, that's a good excuse for a holiday. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can get the real deal is here over in Herefordshire, you know, in Brookhouse Woods and look it up. And it's just amazing there. Yeah, yeah. Those guys are doing some amazing work over there. I filmed previously as well. So yeah, I'll be putting a link down below to uh, the Brookhouse Woods and the work that they're doing there in terms of courses. and. In fact, just a quick side note from that um, is obviously we're here at Spoontown. So once again, I do want to take a moment to thank Jules Swan, the founder of Spoontown, for allowing mayor. us to film here. The mayor of Spoontown, yes. right? And a video too, like the video of Spoontown itself will be down below in the description, as well as a quick thank you to Phil Kyra for letting us use his space. It's quite a sunny day today, so in order to kind of have a bit of shade and whatnot and away from all the castles that are going on. So Phil Kyra, a huge thank you to him. But I did want to mention as a kind of wrap up that Obviously, you do frequent the UK, 
uh, on a regular basis for the events and stuff. Yeah. So by kind of following um, uh, uh, Mikey on his social media, you can find out about the times he is in the UK or even in other countries in general. Um, so when he's, in terms of you know, not being in Israel, if there are other countries that you're based in that you know, Mikey will be visiting at some point in the future, then his social media is a great way of, of keeping up to date with that. So if you don't want to make the visit over to Israel, for example, at the moment he's in the UK and he's going to be running courses here at Spoontown, it's also a great opportunity to learn from Mikey. I can genuinely, sincerely, highly recommend Mikey's teaching. It's always very, very well recommended. Students always speak very highly of it. He's a very, very experienced teacher. And as you can see from this video, hopefully that he's got a very, a real knack for kind of teaching and explaining things, as well as being very, very competent in what he does himself. So Mikey, once again, a sincere thank you. Thank uh, you very much. I really appreciate you yeah. taking the time out to allow me to film and document your process that it may inspire others. And like I said, guys, links for everything down below. And on that note, I shall see you on the next instalment. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Mikey Elephant and myself, Zell Outdoors. Peace out.